In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God and the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we note and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22 verse 17. 22 verse 17. We went over some aspects of this, but now we're going to delve in a little deeper as to what's going on. Tell us, therefore, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar, that is, who represents the Roman Empire, or not? <clears throat> and what they are doing is they're trying to get the Lord to be in conflict with the Romans. He wants them to, he wants to say, he wants them to say the taxes are in fact unjust and therefore they can run to the Romans and say throw him in prison he doesn't believe in taxation while the other on the other hand if he says if he uses the strict view and says you must pay taxes then there'll be a conflict uh, with the Jews so he answers in a very uh, specific way and it's all based on scripture in Romans chapter 13 1 through 7 it tells us this let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except through the agency of God, and the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. So the person who resists such authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist it incur judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you desire to have no fear of authority? Do what is good according to the law of the land, and you will. So this was the principle our Lord was following. And they came up with the idea that they knew that our Lord was speaking of a, 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 a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, rather than a physical kingdom on the earth. And so the question was, can a political kingdom coexist with a spiritual kingdom? And the answer is yes. We live in the world, but we're not of the world. We're, we're of the world. We're in the world. We're not of it. And then 22, 18. But Jesus knew their evil intentions and said, Hypocrites, why are you testing me? Show me the coin used for the tax. So they brought him a denarius. Jesus said to them, Whose image is this on, and whose inscription? And the coin had an image of Tiberius who was the Caesar at that time. Caesar's, they said. And then he said, they, Then pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. And, uh, well, the reason why he calls these folks hypocrites are for many different reasons. He tells them to show them a coin. They're all against paying taxation, but they have uh, in their purses and pocketbooks money, filled with money. And the money that they pull out to show to the Lord is money dealing with the Roman uh, system in which there's a, uh, the face of Caesar on the money. And so the fact was they enjoyed Roman money, yet they did not want to pay tax on that Roman money. That's the first part part of their hypocrisy. They also enjoyed the protection and freedom that they had from the Roman Empire, which they paid for through paying taxes, and they resented that also. So they were very critical of the Romans. They used the Roman roads. They used Roman currency. And the, the Romans, in fact, provided the best system for keeping out barbarians out of Israel. So the Israelites were being very, treated very well by the Romans, and yet they don't want to pay their taxes, showing that they are hypocrites. These are people who enjoy the benefits of the country, but they're not willing to fight for the country. They are people who, en who, en who enjoy the golden egg of capitalism, yet they reject capitalism. They are people who love freedom, but ridicule the uniform. 
like those today uh, marching on Washington. They love their freedom to go march on Washington, but uh, they despise the means by which they got that freedom, and that is freedom through military victory. And then in 2121, Caesar's, they said, then pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, he said. We have the right, and it's a privilege actually, to pay taxes. 22.22 Now when they heard this, they were stunned, and they left him and went away. They were trying to trap him, it wasn't going to work, and so they hung their heads in shame and walked away. And there are several reasons why this occurred. If, if our Lord had take, taken a stand for Rome, and they would have said that he is against religion. And if he had taken a stand for religion, they would have said that he's against Rome. So our Lord, as a genius, refutes both concepts and says that taxation and, spirit, and the spiritual kingdom does coexist. And it coexists all the way down to this very day. Jesus Christ also makes a clear distinction between church and state through these statements. He emphasizes Christian responsibility to the state that maintains its uh, distinction. In Judea, Rome was the state and the Jews were permitted religious freedom. So this counts. In, now if they weren't provided religious freedom, there would be a there would be some recourse for that. But the Roman state over Judea actually provided them with uh, re religious freedom, so there was uh, no way they could uh, revolt because of lack of freedom, because Rome gave them the right of freedom of religion. And therefore, they must function under their concept of taxation, etc. Until Christ personally returns to the earth, there will never be a bona fide mixture of church and state. Until Jesus Christ returns to the earth, there will be, never be a bona fide mixture of church and state. And that is because the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will be the ruler, and uh, we all begin in the millennium as believers. Where a state does not follow the biblical concept of divine institution number four, then the regenerate person must choose for God rather than man. In other words, under the divine institution number four, if you live in China, they do not allow you to worship. They do not allow you to assemble yourselves together to learn the word of God. In such a case, you are not bound by that law. God's law of learning the word of God supersedes that. And while you may go to prison, at least uh, you're doing the right thing in the spiritual life. We haven't gone that far down that path as of yet in this country. When the state opposes freedom, the believer continues to make the issue of salvation clear. And that will help the national unity. You are being patriotic to your national entity when you witness to fellow Americans. So when you witness, that is almost, it is actually a patriotic duty for all of us. We have our own responsibilities as Christians to the state, and that would be to the United States of America. First of all, taxation. We are all responsible to pay our taxes unto George Washington. He's on the, the paper. Mm -hmm. And then military service. We have that responsibility when called on to serve in the military. Voting. We have that responsibility, which is a civil duty. If you don't vote, that's fine, but uh, voting, if you did decide to vote, then that would be part of you functioning in society normally, and it's not really mixing church and state. And then the fourth one, the church should support good government, but the church should never become government. For example, I think George W. Bush is doing a fairly good job, and I support him by prayer and supplication, and so should you. And that's the support we can give to the government. But the church should never become government, and that means don't try to uh, ramrod your own uh, beliefs right through uh, Congress. Or become... I, heard some, I read something the other day, a whole bunch of people from... Was it Texas? It was Texas. A whole bunch of Christians from Texas 
thousands and thousands of them looked at South Carolina and said this would be a wonderful place to set up a Christian state and they're all going to pour in here and set up a Christian state and uh, change the laws etc. That'll be interesting to see and it'll be inter interesting to see my butt get out of here too because that will be the most legalistic type of situation we could ever live under. It would be miserable and we would not have freedom so, <clears throat> continuing, the same day, Sadducees, now we're moving to marriage and the resurrection. And now it's the Sadducees getting on board. And the Sadducees are the uh, Greco type people who are into empiricism. And they are seeking to solve man's problems through politics. So under this concept of marriage and the resurrection, the same day Sadducees, who say, by the way, there is no resurrection, came to him and they asked him, Teacher, not Lord, but teacher, they're unsaved. Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for his brother. That's from Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The second did the same, and the third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. What we have here is the fact that the, five, the wife ha has actually had seven men, all of whom brothers. That's the way they did it back then. One brother dies, goes down to the next brother in line in terms of age. And that brother dies, it goes to the next brother in line in terms of age. So the wife of seven men, all brothers. None of the brothers had children by her. And finally, the woman dies. This is hypothetical. It's a bit out there. It's, it's, it's one of those hypotheticals where that probably never happened. But if it did happen, how would it resolve itself, Lord? And that's their question. And they make a question in this way to trap our Lord. The wife of seven men, all brothers. None of the brothers had children by her, and finally the woman dies. So by doing this, by making up this ridiculous hypothetical situation, what they're really doing is ridic ridiculing the resurrection. Because remember, they don't believe in the resurrection. So in 2228, they ask a question about something they don't believe in, but it's just a way to ridicule uh, the resurrection. In the resurrection then, whose wife of the seven will she be? You see, they're looking at the resurrection as something that everyone's resurrected and then all the human, uh, you, you know, some people might, might be married four or five times and then you go into the resurrection and what they're asking is, when you're resurrected, whose wife are you going to be? You've been married five times, which one are you going to marry this time? But uh, they don't understand that this is spiritual and there is no marriage in heaven. No one is married uh, exclusively to anyone else. In in fact, we are the bride of Christ, and therefore uh, there is no need for marriage in heaven. That concept is gone. We move into a totally a separate and different age that is in heaven, and therefore all mar marital bounds are broken. Now, you'll know your spouse, and you'll be able to say, hey, how you doing, and probably talk, but the, it's not going to be the same, and you're not going to be uh, joined in the same mansion or anything else. You're all going to receive your different rewards and you're all going to have your own individual things that you receive and you'll know each other, but that's about as far as it goes. And there's no sex in resurrection or anything else. So the, those things are gone, but they're thinking that heaven's going to go on as it's gone on on the earth and that, could be, that couldn't be farther from the truth. In the resurrection then, whose wife of the seven will she be? For all, for they all had married her. Jesus is going to bring out the hostility of these people by ripping them apart. And he's going to do this in 22, not 29. Jesus answered them, You are wrong. In the King James it says something about air, I believe. 
but it means you are wrong. And in the Greek, it, it, it's a, a linear action start, meaning you are wrong and you've never been right. You are wrong and you have never been right because you don't know the Scriptures or the power of God. We must extrapolate some points out of this. First of all, you can never understand the power of God until you understand the Word of God, Bible doctrine. You can never understand the power of God until you understand the Word of God. If you have Bible doctrine number 2 or number 50 on your scale of values, then you will not be utilizing fully the power of God. Remember the power, the power options, the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and Operation Z. If you don't function under those two power options, you're a failure in the Christian way of life. And so you could become very emotional as they do in many churches. And you could go through all types of calisthenics and say you love God. Well, it's okay if you love God, but if you don't know the Scriptures, it's false. It's phony. The only way to love God is to know God, and the only way to know God is to know His Scriptures. So we must learn Bible doctrine in order to have true love for God. And then in 22, verse 30, For at the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So this gives us a description of how things will be after the resurrection with us. We'll be resurrected. And if the resurrection occurred in a couple minutes, me and Dallas would be resurrected and we would be in heaven, but the marriage bonds are gone, no longer married, just in heaven. And uh, you'd say, well, isn't that sad? Aren't you going to miss them? No, the old things have passed away. We've moved into something completely and totally different. And we'll all be happy and we'll all remember that we had marriages and relationships that were wonderful. But it has no, once we're there, we're in a state of complete bliss. And we can be in a state of complete bliss just doing what we will. Uh, probably having conversations with the Apostle Paul, maybe even Jesus Christ, and just enjoying being in heaven. And then you can meet all your relatives. You will recognize all your relatives, and you can go talk to them, but those familial ties are broken at the resurrection. And in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. No marriage will go on in heaven between us or among all of us. But what we see here is they are thinking in terms of temporal life. They exclude the idea that heaven is completely different in which divine institution number two is only for time. The divine institution number two, marriage, is only for time. And the, these uh, Sadducees are only thinking in terms of time. And that happens a lot with the uh, people who have a lot of sense and they start to uh, uh, figure out things and they do it in, on the basis of time, etc. But when they die, then what? Then they try to take everything that they've learned and apply it to what's going to happen after death and that none of it adds up because it's far above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. So eternity is improved over time. What I'm saying here is etern not improved over time, but etern eternity is improved over time. Over time, how should I phrase this? Eternity is better than life on earth. That's better. And in eternity, there is a type of love greater than any human love on the earth. And when we go to heaven, uh, while we do have concepts of love on the earth, when we go to heaven, the love will be overwhelming and uh, all of the things on the earth will be gravely dim compared to what we're going to have. So it's not that we're losing anything. We are gaining great improvement. 22.31 But as for the resurrection, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? In Exodus chapter 6, they had brought up a resurrection type verse, 
But he, Jesus knows they're all out of line because these people don't even believe in the resurrection. And now they're bringing out resurrection verses. So our Lord slaps down on them another resurrection verse. But as for the resurrection, have you not read what was spoken to you by God in Exodus 6? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And they were very familiar with this phrase. And they were f familiar with this phrase due to the fact that they always used it. They used it as a type of oath. I swear to you, I will give you the 50 bucks that was loaned to me, I swear this to buy you uh, by the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's how they would do it in their culture. And they would do it all the time so they knew what he was saying. They had heard this phrase before. And then he hits them at the last part of it by saying, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And right there, everybody saying, I am the, uh, saying in, in these uh, things, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But that mean, but he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now all the Sadducees, Sadducees do not believe in life after death. They don't believe in the resurrection, and they don't believe in life after death. So he catches them on that by saying, uh, God is not the God of the dead. Therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not dead. And that they were cut off at the pass. 22.33 When the crowds heard this, they were amazed at his teaching. In fact, they were amazed at the doctrine that was coming out of his lips. So this crowd here is uh, not too interested in miracles, but they really want to know what this, this is all about and what it means. And so the crowds are astounded with how our Lord handles each of the questions and gives a perfect answer that they can understand. Now we move to the greatest commandment. Now when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they mustered their thinking forces. And one of them, an expert in religious law, asked to the rest, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Now we see what happened here is all of them got together and they had a big a think tank type situation in which they would go through 1 through 10 of the Ten Commandments. And they would say, if he says the number one is the highest, which, was, uh, which is uh, to have no other gods before me. If he says number one is the highest, we'll pick another one out and make that one the highest. And so they studied this and they had an answer for all ten of those and they were ready to get him. And they thought they were because they're bringing out the big guns now. Bringing out the great expert of the religious law. And uh, he, he was eager to get a chance to uh, figure this out and to actually um, trap the Lord with oratory. And one of them, an expert in the, in the religious law, asked to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, Love. And this love is, of course, from relationship with God, but I'll give it to you like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That is thinking, the stream of consciousness. That's where we do our thinking. With all your thinking, with all your soul, What's in your soul is volition, that is, make a choice to believe what you hear. With all your thinking, with all your volition, and with all your mental attitude, perception. So again, love the Lord your God with all your thinking, with all your volition, positive volition, and with all your mental perception. The relationship uh, to God and to have love for God and this relationship is in three areas in which it can be de developed. First of all, we have thinking. That's heart as it comes out in the King James and it's thinking. Then we have volition. And volition is in the soul 
And, the, and you, a, a person who has a soul, your soul, could say yes or no. But the volition in this case says, yes, I believe it. And then down to the third is mental, perce- mental perception. And that's when it moves into the memory center. And that is where doctrine can be stored so that you can handle situations in life. So Jesus said to him, Love the Lord thy God with all your thinking, with all your volition, and with all your mental perception. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now that threw them right, that threw them a loop. They were looking at the Ten Commandments, and our Lord just went to the whole, the, the whole, the whole thing that holds the Ten Commandments together. It's like the bridge. Everything else is, that's dangling under the bridge is just a, a sideshow. And so he brings them straight to the bridge. A second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. A second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what is encapsulated here is personal love for God the Father plus impersonal love for all mankind. That was the highest source in the Old Testament of fulfilling the Mosaic Law. And if you had uh, love, uh, impersonal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind, you'd reached your ultimate in the Old Testament spiritual life. And this is where we get the fact that, uh, well, when you, when you are straight with God... You will be straight with people. Now, if you try to be straight with God, straight with people to get straight with God, that's not the way it works. You must be straight with God first, and then you'll be right with man. Otherwise, your, all of your relationships will falter in some way. 2240. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And this is dealing with uh, the Torah. Everything that had been taught in the past uh, under what we, we, we would call it the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament. They called it the law and the prophets and the Torah, etc. Personal love for God the Father and impersonal love for all mankind are the highest commandments in the law. So he shut them up, and they uh, they were really uh, right now they're stunned because they thought after all that study they thought that they would really trap him on something, and then he sideswipes them by by not even accepting their premise and by going to the highest portion of the law and working downward from there. Now we move to to the Messiah, David's son and Lord, twenty two forty one. While the Pharisees were assembled, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said. The son of David. What do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? They said, the son of David. He said to them, How then does David by the Spirit call him Lord? Now, let's deal with 2242 first. They got the answer right. He is the son of David. It's partially right. They recognize his humanity. And finally, they recognize him as being in the lineage of royalty. They recognize him now as human royalty. But they're not saved. That doesn't mean they're saved. They simply say, yeah, he's the son of David. But they do not believe he is the Messiah. And by their answer, our Lord knows that they're not saved. So he's going to prod them a little more. This is how, this is actually, there are a bunch of Pharisees here, a bunch of religious leaders here, and this is the first uh, a heavy attack uh, from our Lord toward the Pharisees in which he is going to bring them face to face with the gospel and they're going to reject it. But he's going to make it very clear to them that he is the Son of God. But they're going to reject it because what happens now is this. 
He said to them, How then does David by the Spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord, Jehovah, said to my Lord, Adonai, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And that would have, that would have been the question that should have made them really begin to think that he was the Messiah. Because what's happening in here is this. The Lord, Jehovah, God the Father, said to my Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, this is David speaking, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. After the resurrection of our Lord, He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And the fact that He is seated means one thing. He has humanity. God does not sit. The angels are never uh, really said to sit except when they go into a person's house. Even then there's no indication that they sit. But uh, God the Father never sits. And so what's happening here is we have God the Father and God the Son. And the only reason God the Son can sit is because He's in hypostatic union and His humanity can sit. So what He's telling them is... He is the Son of God. This is the best way He could tell them He's the Son of God. By giving them this verse. And instead of believing it, they walk away. And they don't even want to question Him any longer. Which this shows they were pretty upset by what our Lord said. Because it got their wheels turning in their head. Because He he made it very clear. First He said, Who do you think I am? And they would say, you are the son of David. And then he would say, okay. In, in this passage, the, the Lord, Jehovah, said to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. That should have been enough to make them wake up and say that uh, even though uh, Jesus Christ would be from the line of David, that he would be David's Lord, meaning that there would be the humanity of Christ, meaning that he is the Messiah. But they rejected it. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? That's something they probably went to bed and chewed on for a while or had a nervous breakdown over. So no one was able to answer him a word. And from that day on, no one dared to question him any longer. They had been humiliated each time. So after all this occurs, and they've stopped us throwing arrows now because they know that they're in the wrong and no more arrows. Any arrow that they throw at him, he throws right back and sticks them in the hiney. So they're just done with it. And so uh, what happens next is our Lord takes the gloves off. He's wanted them to believe. He's brought them down to the point to where they almost believe, but they too stubborn to do so. So now our Lord is moving into the condemnation of religion. And this time He's going to take the gloves off. He's been uh, uh, patting around uh, the boxing ring with them over and over again. But now He's taking the gloves off and this will be nearing the end of His ministry because He's about to enrage a lot of people on purpose because they need to be uh, brought down into humility so that they can realize they are a sinner in need of salvation. So what we have is this condemnation of religion, and the reason why is because religion is counterfeit of the truth. Religion is the counterfeit of truth. And this comes in eight different categories. Religion is the counterfeit of truth. It comes in eight different categories. Point one, counterfeit doctrine. Counterfeit doctrine. This is found in 1 Timothy 4.1. Counterfeit doctrine. And there's a lot of counterfeit doctrine today. I'm not going to list one. We've all come across them. Then there is counterfeit communion. 
counterfeit communion. And that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 20, and 21. Counterfeit communion. And there's a lot of places that have counterfeit communion. The one in uh, Corinthians, their counterfeit communion was to go and get drunk off the wine when you're not even supposed to use wine in the communion. And they would get drunk and eat a lot and that would be their communion, a good social get-together. And then they would get drunk and have brawls and it really wasn't a very well-handled situation. Uh, and that would be a counterfeit communion. And we have counterfeit communions today in which you can only partake of communion if you're a member of a church, etc. And uh, following all these guidelines that our Lord never set up. Then we have counterfeit ministers. Counterfeit ministers. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Counterfeit counter, counterfeit ministers and oftentimes they're very uh, they go off and they have a very eloquent speaking voice and they get people worked up to give up a lot of money and then make some proclamation that they've seen heaven and that it was beautiful and give me money etc so those are counterfeit ministers 2 Corinthians 11 13 through 15 counterfeit gospel we got uh, plenty of that going around. I won't repeat it, but just so your ears won't burn. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. Counterfeit gospel. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. Then we have counterfeit spirituality. Galatians 3, 2 and 3. Galatians 3, 2 and 3. Then we have counterfeit righteousness. Matthew 19, 16 through 28. Matthew 19, 16 through 28. The seventh, counterfeit power. Counterfeit power. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. And then lastly, counterfeit God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Counterfeit God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. So these are some of the reasons why our Lord Jesus Christ is going to have a full frontal assault on religion. Because religion is the big counterfeit. It's Satan's counterfeit system. That's Satan's defense. And so... Uh, if you go out and you uh, try to throw the football across the, the one-yard line for a touchdown and uh, counterfeit doctrine comes along and uh, uh, throws out a flag, I, don't, I can't get a good analogy, but throws out a flag and they say five yards back. But it's just a counterfeit and it's part of Satan's defense, or actually offense, part of Satan's offense to keep us from living the unique spiritual life. 23.1 Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, For their benefit. Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, For their benefit. He's speaking to the multitude to warn them concerning the religious crowd. The religious crowd may be there, but his comments are being directed toward those who aren't in the religious crowd so that they can be warned about the religious crowd so that they are not taken astray by the religious crowd. That's because religion is the greatest enemy of Christianity. It's the greatest enemy of Bible doctrine and truth, and it's the greatest enemy of the world in general. 23.2 The experts in the law and the Pharisees sit on the professorship of Judaism. Therefore, pay attention to what they tell you according to the Mosaic Law and do it. But do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach, teach. One more time, you'll, get, you'll understand it in a moment. Therefore, pay attention to what they tell you according to the Mosaic Law, and do it. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach. 
Now the law in itself is holy, just, and good. How could the law not be holy, just, and good? The law is from God. And at this time, Israel functions under the law. So the law is holy, just, and good. But the legalists took the law, the religious crowd took it, and distorted it into a system of legalism. The word of God should be obeyed, but the word of God in, di in distortion should not be obeyed. And that's the principle. And our Lord was telling them to follow the law because they're still in Israel. They're still functioning under the laws of Israel. There is no church as of yet. They go to the synagogues, which are now apostate. But usually in the past, they would go to the synagogue to learn the law. And the law was set up so that they could learn they were sinners, learn that they were in need of a Savior, then learn about the Savior and believe in Christ. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. So Abraham simply believed. But there were a shadow, uh, shadows of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ that were used as teaching aids. And so all the Jews still, even up until this point, are to obey the law. The works of the scribes and Pharisees will be described in the context of chapter 23. This is where he's really going to lay down the law on the scribes and Pharisees. They include three things. This is what the scribes and Pharisees have done to the law. The law which is holy, just, and good. But man got a hold of the law and this is what he turned it into. Three things. Either religionism, legalism, or externalism. Externalism has to do with uh, ritual. Ritual without reality. They would wear clothes, certain types of external clothes, and go through certain types of rituals. The one that I think of today is the Pope with the white hat on his head. That's a ritual, and it, is, it could be part of this externalism type thing. So those are the three things. These professors of theology had authority, but it was accompanied by incompetence. They had authority. They had gone to the schools. They had studied very hard, but it was, they were incompetent because they did not know the deeper meaning of uh, Codex number 1, 2, and 3 of the Mosaic Law had no clue what it meant. The only way to obey the Mosaic Law is to start at the cross. And that is why the Mosaic Law was actually created. So it would focus mankind on the cross in the Old Testament. Codex number one with all its rules and regulations was designed to show that man is a sinner. That man is imperfect. Codex number two Jesus Christ is presented as Savior in Codex number 2 through sacrifices, through the holy day, through the priesthood, through the structure of the tabernacle, through all of, those, all of these beautiful things that were in the temple uh, begin to show a picture of the Lord dying as a substitute on the cross for everyone. That was Codex number 2. Codex number 3 were, were, was for how the Israelites should live in time. Codex number one, you're all sinners, need a savior. Codex, codex number two, here, we will reveal you your savior. Codex, codex number three, this is how you should live in time. And it was all set up very perfectly and beautifully if people knew doctrine and did not distort the doctrine. When the unbeliever or legalist teaches the law, he distorts it into a system of religion and legalism which is a system of hypocrisy. And they're trying to say that uh, the Mosaic Law saves. Well, the Mosaic Law in Codex number 2 reveals how to be saved, but it does not save. These religious distortions of the Mosaic Law do not provide an excuse to the Jew to uh, ignore or reject the law. While Jesus does not condone the legalistic perversions of the Pharisees, he does demand an observance of the law in its true biblical perspective. 
That is for the Jew. We are, we are not under the law anymore. We'll study that all through Romans and all through the epistles. Jesus lives in the age of the law. We are still de- dealing here with the age of the Jews, not the age of the church. So in 23.4, this is what our Lord tells about the Pharisees. They tie heavy loads. Those are extra, extra biblical taboos from the Mishnah. They tie heavy loads that are too hard to carry and put them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. These heavy loads are all of these extra biblical taboos. And when someone would break one of those extra biblical taboos, uh, they wouldn't help them. They would ridicule them and then slap a $100, $200 fine on them. You didn't do this the way the law said so or the way the taboo says so. You are now fined or you now go to prison for two years. They were very tough. And so they heaped up this heavy load. Let me give you some of the heavy loads from the Mishnah. Some of these taboos which are ridiculous. These are extra biblical by the way. These taboos aren't part of the Bible. It's what the legalists have added in over the centuries. Point one, unlawful to carry food from one house to another on the Sabbath. That's one taboo they added. Now, under the true concept, you, you baked your food, the whole family made the food before Sabbath. And then they sat around on Sabbath day and ate, ate the double portion that day. They had to cook for two, an extra. And that's how they did it. But that's the only requirement that was given. There was nothing about carrying your food to a neighbor or to share it or to have a picnic or anything like that. No picnics, in other words, on the Sabbath. This was an extra, this was part of their extra addition. Number two. A donkey could not be let out on the road until its trappings had been put on it the day before. So if you're going to let your donkey out of your garage, you couldn't do that unless you had it all set up to go the day before. Point three, an egg could not be boiled on the Sabbath. Well, this was the first uh, edict that came down from the religious nuts. And then what happened was uh, people decided, well, I can't boil my egg on the Sabbath. I'll just stick it really close to the, the kettle. So then they found out about it. And so they added this one. Nor put it near a hot kettle. And then someone else got smart who didn't believe this taboo. So they would wrap it in a very hot cloth. So they had to come up with another one. Nor wrap it with a hot cloth. Then somebody else said, hmm, I'll go stick it out in the hot sand in the summer. Nor put it in the sun in the sand. (laughs) See how silly all these taboos go? And you can obviously tell nobody's minding their own business. It would be a terrible place to live under such religion. People always got their nose in your business. People coming over, hey, are you cooking? That would just irritate me. They would have beat me half silly after I beat a few others half silly. That just, that goes against all freedom. But that's what taboos do. Unlawful to light or extinguish lamps on the Sabbath. So if you, if you cut out your lights the night before the Sabbath, you will have no light nights until Sunday. Saturday, no electricity. Sunday, it's back on. It was unlawful to move furniture on the Sabbath, except when used as a ladder, but then you can only take it four steps. A true taboo. So if you needed to arrange your furniture as a ladder, you could only take four steps in doing it. Point six. 
unlawful to wear ornaments on the Sabbath. Point seven, unlawful to tie sandals on the Sabbath. So if you have your shoes on when the Sabbath Sabbath hits, you must sleep with your sandals. And you must get up with your sandals and wear your sandals all day and until sunset. So you should get your sandals off before sundown so that you can go barefoot. You won't be going outside anyway. Number eight, forbidden to fix a leaky barrel of water. Got to let your precious water flow away. You couldn't, now this one's something else. You could not stop bleeding of a wound on a Sabbath. If you accidentally cut yourself in your little hut on the Sabbath, just got to let it bleed. Don't even try to put a bandage around it or anything else. And if you do, and they're crazy laws, but if you do, you are you may have a fine or a jail time. Now, none of this is part of Scripture. This is what the Mishnah added added to it. Point ten: False teeth or a gold plug could not be worn on the Sabbath. A lot of funny looking people on the Sabbath. <laughs> All sewing, crafts, crafts, dyeing, all of those things you ladies like to do, you cannot do them on the Sabbath. Then number 12, this one's weird. A radish could be dipped in salt on the Sabbath. I guess a lot of the religious guys like to dip their uh, radish in salt and eat it. But they even make a point on this. A radish could be dipped into salt on the Sabbath, but not too long because it could be pickled, and pickling is unlawful on the Sabbath. Point 13. Crazy, I know. Point 13. If you have a muddy dress, you, this is for the ladies, of course, you must wait until it dries, and then you had to crinkle it Crinkle the dress where the mud was to make all the dirt fall off. You couldn't brush it with your hand. You had to crinkle it and then do that and then hope it all falls off. If not, too bad. You have to wait till the next day to clean your clothes. So this is how, this is how far it went. These are the heavy loads that they placed on people. So in 23, verse 5, they do all their deeds to be seen by people. That's approbation, lust, of course. For they make their phylacteries. A phylactery is a small leather case containing Old Testament scripture verses. It's worn on the arm and it's worn around the forehead. And they use it, use it especially when praying. Again, this, uh, uh, this, these phylacteries are small leather cases containing Old Testament scripture verses worn on the arm and the forehead by the Jews, especially when praying. They wore these things like a good luck charm. They wore these things like the Catholics wear the St. Christopher or a cross around the neck. And they also wore these things to show how... Uh, far up in society they had gone and how religious they were and how everyone should praise them. So that that's what that's all about. And they wore them wide and their tassels long. You see, the more you spent in prayer, the longer your tassels, tassels would be made. And if you were one of these that have tassels dragging the ground, you must be extremely holy. So you can tell how they started to think of themselves, all dressed up like that, and they thought they were the holiest thing ever, dressed ornately, uh, having the Bible verses all over their body. They're like they would be like super pope or something, and just doing that. And then, <laughs> and then they would get up in front of the crowds, and everybody would have approbation, lust for them, and he would wave his hand at them. And, uh, well, that's what they were all about. But now imagine you thinking of yourself that highly, and then the Lord Jesus Christ is looking at you and calling you a hypocrite and ripping you apart. Well, all that sweetness and light very quickly left 
these uh, Pharisees and it, it, it's go time. They're ready to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll study more on this full frontal assault on religion uh, tomorrow night. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.